The, the last panel, I'm going to give you a, um, I'm going to give you a, I guess, a caveat on it. Um, this has been such an amazing conference and um, assemblage of, of ideas and presentations and perspectives and issues that we are not going, what we're not going to do is summarize and conclude. We're not going to do that because there's just too much. Um, it'll be on the it'll be on the internet available. The the um, we'll, we'll edit these presentations, and you'll be able to go look at ones that either you missed or you want to see again. And there are a number of them that I I want to see again. But what we've done today is we've got four people who have been involved in on working on conservation issues in from different perspectives and in different arenas for a long time and have been leaders on in, on, in this field um, and people to whom we've turned for a long time for advice and direction. And so what they will do is speak not as long as per, per person as our former panelists did, but maybe, you know, five to ten minutes, I should say, about now. I know I should not say six and a half minutes. No one gets that. Uh, but between, you know, five and ten minutes, given their inclination, and putting what they've heard and what they have uh, concluded into perspective, into context. The, the one thing I do want to mention again on the carbon offsets, I noticed Mike Cowick arrived from the South Carolina Electric Cooperatives, and we will be doing carbon offsets, so we'll be carbon neutral. Um, and I wanted to also just mention, because we worked with, uh, we've worked with Mike and the electric cooperatives over the last number of years on energy issues in the legislature, and have been very, very happy to be able to have the electric co-ops as allies. But Mike, in particular, has been a guy who's brought values into this conversation, and he does it uh, he doesn't, he's not embarrassed by it. He's talked about the importance of providing um, electric power in an affordable way to people in rural South Carolina who can really are the ones who can least afford to, to deal with rate increases that result from any number of things. Bad decision making by, the, by our utilities, by our state owned utility. And um, so I just want to point out that there is a place in this political conversation for values, and some people fortunately are, are feel confident enough to, to make that um, part of what they talk, how they approach these issues. I want to make one, I, one thing. David Orr did not say what I thought he was going to say when um, he spoke. He said everything else, and it was wonderful. Uh, but. The, the point about hope is, is one that to me is, um, is, is, is critical for all of us as individuals as we move forward. And David described hope this way. He said, hope is a verb with sleeves rolled up. And what I think we, are, what we need to do as, as citizens of the low country and what this panel, these panelists have done is hope with their sleeves rolled up. The next few uh, years and, and into the decade will be very important for us. So that should be one of the, to me, the driving forces, the concept of, of hope and optimism, but also realism and the acknowledgement that we have to commit ourselves in a serious way to this work. Um, and the work, as we heard earlier, is affirming in terms of how our values actually evolve. The, the other point I'd want to make, just in my take on this, and not, it's not a conclusion, but it really is a summary of what we've been hearing, is that we've heard about a number of different um, perspectives on this. We've heard about context. To me, in some ways, the most important conclusions about, from these, these panels have been that context is critically important. We cannot just present facts and expect outcomes. And the context that exist here uh, in this state and in the low country is, is fascinating, it's rich, it's complicated, and we have to, we really have to very deliberately understand it. The context is, um, 
is, is historical, it is uh, neurological and evolutionary, as we heard from Drew. Uh, it, is, it is spiritual. Um, it has to do with government structures and governance. Um, it has to do with culture. And if we ignore it, uh, then we are not likely to be successful as we move forward. But if we draw on it and learn from it, we are likely to have a very powerful story that can move us forward. And the stories that we heard uh, both on the side, on the, from the religion panel and from Drew, stories are key. Narrative is a very key part of this. We all have narratives that we, that define ourselves, that we, we define ourselves with, we define our communities with those narratives. And we have to understand them and explicitly understand what they mean for our relationship to the environment. Um, the other part of, other, frame of this, I guess, is, uh, is constituencies. And we have worked um, over the years with a, I'd say, a fairly narrow constituency. A group of, of people, in our case, members of four or 5,000 people who care enough to, to do a thing, and that is to join a conservation group, in some cases to weigh in on issues, whether it be solar leasing or the conservation bank. These are great people, and they're our core, but the other point I think that's come out very clearly is that these constituencies, as we all know, are a, a small fraction of the, of the community that we all live in, and we need to engage beyond that, those, uh, those boundaries. We can do that because some of the issues that we work on tend to uh, expand our horizons and our reach, our reach. Agriculture is a new one for us, but we heard on the agriculture panel yesterday, the power that this whole movement has to allow us to think not only about what we eat, but how it's grown, how responsibly it's grown, where it's grown, what it, that the implications are for social equity, what the implications are for land use, and ultimately what the implications are for the, the future of our region, our reliance on our own abilities to produce, but also for the future of the planet. We also heard, and especially today from Drew, but really throughout the whole panel, we heard about the importance of messages, of language, of, again, of stories. And the stories that we've been hearing are ones that uh, are particular examples. Charlotte, we heard about as moving uh, a, a very impressive agenda forward. We heard from Tom Peterson about the Pacific Northwest focusing on how they could take advantage of this new emerging global economy in energy conser in conservation, energy conservation. Um, we also heard about the problems that we face, and these are very richly narrated stories. We, um, sadly, uh, we have an abundance of them in this state, uh, and those are stories about government that does not work well, people who are not acting in the best interest of the community and of their constituents. About corruption, as we heard from, um, uh, from Drew earlier and also about on the political panel, very powerful presentations on that, but what we can do about it. We also heard about metrics, and uh, in some ways metrics are language. Those metrics, the way we measure things, are the way we we set our goals and our aspirations. If we measure only gross domestic product, then we are looking at volume and, and churning basically dollars through the system without looking at other issues like equity and quality of life and environmental degradation or resource consumption. So those are new, uh, th there should be a new way uh, to frame these uh, these issues, and Simon Kuznets, I'd forgotten, it was the one who came up with GDP, but I was fascinated to hear that he warned about using GDP as the sole indicator of national progress. And we should very much take that into consideration as we move forward. So, um, finally, I guess we heard about emotion and the importance of it, the centrality of it, whether it is um, to the detriment of our decision making or more importantly, uh, in its ability to motivate us to do the right thing. Uh, the importance of not being embarrassed when we're elected, we have 
folks elected to county council, it always strikes me, the first thing that happens is they turn into economists from people. They start talking about very narrow range of, of, of things. They feel embarrassed, I think, to talk about the things they did talk about when they were unelected, about their love for nature, the importance of the next generation. Those are things that we should not be embarrassed to talk about, about culture, about the significance of the unique quality of life in this, in this state and in this region. Those are stories that we need to tell. And as we advocate, and also just as we, as we play a role, the role of citizens in this community. So I'll start out by, uh, in, and we're going to go roughly in this order, from Charles in that direction, from uh, right to left, with no significant political implication there. <laughs> Um, we'll start with Charles Lane, and I'll, let me introduce people again just quickly. Charles is a, one of our great friends and longtime allies, even literally from the beginning of the movement. Charles was the founder of the Ace Base, first chairman of the Ace Base and Task Force, chairman of the State Conservation Bank. He's been on virtually every board of every org environmental organization in the Low Country and has been a supporter and, and leader. Uh, of this movement, and one of the many contributions he's made is the importance of moving the whole movement forward, of not people having isolated uh, victories that they individually take credit for, but looking at the big picture. And Charles has done that for 25 years. Um, so he will, and he's been most recently involved in this agricultural work and very enthusiastic about that work. Um, Emory Campbell, who was a founding board member of the League, I'm proud to say, but before that was uh, really the first person I ever heard talk about the significant relationship between culture, human culture and land, land conservation. Emory, before, long before it was cool, was explaining the relationship of this, this extraordinarily rich place we live, the human environment, to the, to the natural environment and has done such a wonderful job. He was uh, head of the Penn Center and um, has now been, he's on the Gullah Geechee Carter Commission and has just been a wonderful ally and a, we're, we're proud to have been a friend of his. Um, Hamilton Davis, the, the youngster on the panel, uh, is our energy program director and Hamilton is from Sumter. He went to Clemson and was a religion major so he can relate to the um, panel that we heard a few ago, uh, and then is, uh, went to law school in Carolina and has one of the most um, inquisitive minds of anybody I know. He's, I, we have a great time in the office debating everything from, you know, libertarianism to, um, you name it, energy policy. And Hamilton has been working in Columbia and has had a real experience um, I think even though he, was, he grew up in South Carolina, learning about how politics in South Carolina really does work. Uh, but he's done a wonderful job and we've moved a number of bills forward uh, both the last few sessions and we're continuing to work on some this session. Um, and then David Shai, whom you've already heard introduced, but also as, as was said earlier, David um, is really in South Carolina one of the great leaders institutionally to move Furman University, in this case, a university forward in the arena of sustainability. Um, and you heard earlier, he has many other attributes and understanding of how history and um, our cultural traditions have shaped the way we, we think about the environment. So we'll start with Charles and um, we can uh, cogitate on what we've learned and where we think we should need, where we need to go. And I'll get us back on schedule. The path forward. Um, I don't think you can really guess where we're going in the future if you don't look a little bit backwards. Back in 1989, when I got involved in conservation, if you looked at the state of the condition of the landscape, particularly as it relates to land conservation, I mean, there really was no movement. The Department of Natural Resources was doing their thing. The federal government was doing its thing. We had NGOs that were doing their stuff. We had the Sierra Club acting out there. Sort of what's happening in most states in the nation. And left to that, South Carolina would have been doomed to the same fate 
southern Florida and New Jersey. We had had a lot of nice little parks scattered around, urban sprawl, roads going everywhere. But what happened was, by luck, by chance, or as Francis Klein, who used to run Mepkin Abbey said, these things just don't happen, Charles. The Ace Basin Task Force, Coastal Conservation League, Low Country Open Land Trust, Ducks Unlimited, uh, Buford Land Trust, it runs through so many, Southern Environmental Law Center, they all sort of arrived here on the scene at the same time. And what got me involved personally was a development down the river from our family land and a, and a brother who said, you need to go see this guy, Dana Beach, who uh, works for Arthur Ravenel. And we had a meeting, and one thing really led to the other. But what really happened in South Carolina we can have great pride in is that it was a partnership amongst the conservation community. And that's not just NGOs in the land trust tradition, but it is also advocacy, law, government, and most importantly, the people who live here, the private landowners, the people that own the land. And so the Ace Basin model was transformed up and down the coast of South Carolina. And what happened was, if you look there, it's really remarkable, and it's something most people don't even know, that along the coastal plain of South Carolina, over a million acres of land has been protected. It's phenomenal, and it just wouldn't have happened. And it's a great thing, and I hope it continues and we protect land, but it's getting increasingly more difficult. I mean, we got the low-hanging fruit. And if we don't do something different in the future, then I think it too will be sort of doomed to a certain fate that we don't want. Because there'll be infrastructure investments, roads, there'll be zoning issues, there'll be subdivisions, we'll fragment things. And so as I look to the path forward, I think we need to look at conservation as an economic issue. Dana spoke about agriculture. One that long ago, that the conservation community, the environmental community was at odds with agriculture. They were promoting hog farms. We were against it. We thought we had a pretty good argument as to why we don't want hog farms, industrial hog farms in South Carolina. But we were pitted at each other. But after a period of time, we began to look at the world the same way. And so uh, two nights ago, we had dinner. And there was a secretary of agriculture there at the Coastal Conservation League because we're in bed together because we are looking at agriculture, which is keeping our land base and helping to preserve and promote the South Carolina economy. And there's probably nothing you can do to help South Carolina's rural economy and protect land from being converted to another use than promoting sustainable agriculture. And it's low hanging fruit. Again, it's right there. In North Carolina, gross farm income is $1,200 an acre. Georgia, it's 825, and in South Carolina, it's $475. So if we just got parity with Georgia, we could improve the wealth of our rural areas without undermining those rural values and add $2 billion to the rural economy. And we have to drive conservation as an economic initiative. And we, we get marginalized going forward, but just think about this. I mean, what kind of economic sense does it make to put houses on our best farmland? What kind of economic sense does it make not to have land use planning so that our industrial forests don't get fragmented, so you can't burn it, to make those mills less productive, and thousands and thousands of jobs that would be lost because we did no planning. What kind of economic sense does it make to have the drinking water of the Grand Strand threatened with a coal ash dump that's in the floodplain? So I think we to accomplish this and the path forward is to create new partnerships to bring a broader group together. And just think of the groups that should be a part of it. We mentioned agriculture, but forestry, the CDCs, the heirs property, historic preservation, cultural preservation groups, spiritual groups, academics. And if we all got together and, and really thought about the areas that we agree, I believe we can push forward good governance. And I'll leave you on this. I'm, an, I'm not a Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal. I'm an optimist. And I, have, I think South Carolina has the greatest chance of any place I've ever been in my life to pull this off because the people are connected to the land. And I'll give you a good example. 
We had a senator who put a hole on the conservation bank bill. He's from Spartanburg. And, you know, the phone calls come. He could kill funding for the conservation bank. So I called my brother and I said, Hugh, do you think George Dean Johnson, who's one of the biggest businessmen in the state, could intervene? And so Hugh called him up and he says, George Dean, if this guy stops the conservation funding, the Ace Basin's doomed. George Dean's a duck hunter. He's got a place. He called three minutes later. This guy called back and said, I'm taking my name off the bill. That's the new partnership I'd like to see. Thank you. <laughs>